Therefore, I propose to deal with this motion in two main parts and very briefly, namely, of what significance is such a declaration of objective? And secondly, why should the objective be 1956? Sir, I believe that a declaration of objective by this house has become a matter of supreme importance in our march towards self-government. For the time being, this legislature is the supreme voice of the people of this country. Although not all the majority decisions which have been taken in this house in the past could hope to survive the test of a referendum, it is essential, in my view, to, uh, to assess by a formal motion of this nature the honest feelings of various sections of this house and to discover to what extent these feelings may truly reflect the aspiration aspirations of the politically conscious citizens of this country. Self-government is, after all, sir, a subject on which it is of the importance of the first importance that people should believe rightly. And I cannot overstress the great inspiration and succor which various political parties in this country would derive therefrom if the demand for self-government in 1956 were to enjoy the full force of the backing of the highest legislature of the country. Some honorable members may feel that the issue of self-government is not one for this house to decide. It may be argued that it has very little to do with the present administration of this country. But speaking for this side of this house, sir, we have always felt the that the House of Representatives should serve a dual purpose in our political progress. Firstly, that it is our duty to utilize the powers which we now enjoy in this House to further the expansion of our economy and of our social services and to remove obstacles on the road to freedom. Or secondly, and perhaps even more important, we, we must use this House of Representatives itself to continue the fundamental struggle for national freedom. One of the basic nerves in the furtherance of that struggle, and even though we carry it on with less violent methods than the people of Kenya have found it necessary to employ, it is nevertheless a struggle. It's a statement of our goal, and that is why, in my view, it is necessary for this house to express an opinion on this subject. A declaration of objectives, sir, is important in other respects. We and our people can be likened to builders. We have set out to build a new state. From the multitude of tribes in the country, we are, we are striving to build a new and modern structure. Self-government is merely the foundation of that structure. This work of construction is a romantic idea to me, and I am sure that honorable members will agree with me that we are all proud and honored to be the architects and that we should be grateful to province, I mean, sorry, so we should be grateful to providence rather, that this task has fallen upon our generation. But among the responsibilities which accompany this great honor and privilege is the important decision which none but ourselves can make as to when we shall strike the first sword in this new edifice. Many honorable members, sir, have had houses built for them. Others, like myself, may only have seen them built. In the north, I have seen peasants construct their own hamlets. For many years, these poor peasants must have planned and dreamed of their own little homes. They did not just sit by and hope that providence would create a new home for them. They did not say to themselves, I shall lay the foundation of my new home as soon as practicable. That is not planning. On the contrary, I am sure that they must have examined their own earnings and their business prospects over a period. Then considered their commitments and found out where savings might be made here and there. And they could say to themselves, by the grace of Allah, 
I shall lay my foundation in three or five years' time. Now, the builders of a nation, as we are, are not different from these poor peasants. That is why in places like Russia, England, India, and other countries, their government set out a declaration of objectives embodied in five-year plans. And all that this motion has of this legislature is to follow in the footsteps of these great and wiser nations and to establish a political objective towards the and, I mean, attainment of which we can bend the energies of our own people. Many years ago, sir, when I was a young boy and I entered public life, the popular slogan was self-government in our lifetime. But as the country advanced, this slogan, this slogan went out of book and the new catchphrase was self-government as soon as practicable. That in many years back, I mean, that is many years back. As I have said, I do not wish to deal with the argument for self-government and our desire for freedom uh, grew. But anybody who has kept pace with political advancement or with the trends of political thoughts in this country in the past seven years will agree that the bare idea of self-government is no longer attractive, is no longer enough. Whether it is expressed as self-government in our lifetime or self-government in the shortest possible time, or self-government in as soon as practicable, it has ceased to be a progressive view. Because Nigerian nationalism had moved, has moved forward from that position. The question in the public my mind since the end of the war has been self-government. When? What time? What date? That is the question which this motion now invites honorable members we should be true representatives, representatives of that same public, which is demanding an answer to answer. There is a third reason, sir, why a declaration of objective is important. We do not want to part with the, with the British people with rancor. For many years, they have ruled us. We are not an unreasonable people. And like a good house servant, it is only fair that we should give our masters notice of our intention to quit so that they can effect arrangements either to employ new servants or to serve themselves. We do not wish to take them by surprise. On the contrary, we wish to invite them to cooperate with us in the attainment of our objectives. Honorable members, may remember that the Indian cause alienated a lot of sympathy in the United Kingdom because of what was regarded as the indecent haste with which the British evacuated or withdrew from India. The British mind, essentially a conservative mind, does not like things thrust upon it all of a sudden. We all know that. This motion is designed, therefore, to acquaint the British public with what we are thinking, with what we are feeling, so that our, our agitation in 1956 for self-government will not come to them as a surprise. This motion will also afford the British government sufficient time within which to arrange gradual withdrawal and progressive transfer of power to Nigerians. Sir, so, a declaration of objectives such as this is essential for a fourth reason. It is now accepted by the highest international bodies that there should be a time limit for self-government self for colonial territories. I may mention here, without giving any way, anything away, that one of the questions which the recent British Labour Party delegation to West Africa asked my party was what the House of Representatives thought about self-government in Nigeria, I mean for Nigeria in 1956. The Trusteeship Council of the United Nations Organizations as requested government administering trust territories uh, to, fix tag, I mean, to fix target dates when territories will attain self-government. The International Confederation 
of free trade unions has also declared its acceptance of the principle that a time limit should be set by occupying powers and imperialist government for self-government for dependencies. Even in Britain itself, a large body of opinion is growing in support of this principle. I well recall, sir, that when I was in England last year, Mr. Penner Brockway, a well-known socialist MP, said in the course of a colonial affairs debate in the House of Commons, in quote, I should like to urge upon this house and particularly upon the Secretary of State for the Colonies, that if we are to secure the confidence, trust, and cooperation of peoples in the colonial territories, the best way to do it would be in discussion, consultation, and agreement with them to fix a target date when in each respective colony, the goal of self-government should be secured. And I believe that if it were possible to pursue such a policy, we would change the psychology of colonial peoples. I myself think that that was a very correct assessment of our psychology. It is clear that such international organization as I have mentioned and men like Mr. Brockway are thinking along the lines of this motion. And I think it is up to this legislature representing the peoples of this country to strengthen their hands. That, sir, is very briefly the first part of my argument explaining the significance of a declaration of political objective. Now, sir, if it is agreed that an objective should be declared, what should it be? It may be asked, why pick on 1956? Is not 1956 an arbitrary date? What consideration have led to the decision on this date? Mr. President, two of the many factors which had influenced our selection of this date are the factor of convenience and the factor of previous commitment. 1956 is convenient, sir, because it is a year which will see the end of the present constitution. The constitution order in council is dated 1951 and is supposed to expire in five years. It is public knowledge that all true nationalists have made up their minds that this is the last constitution prescribing a dependent status which the people of this country can tolerate. To recommend a date earlier than 1956 would be to put a premature end to the life of this constitution. And although, and although I myself can contemplate such a cause with pleasure, we know too well how strenuously some sections of the country would resist it. In addition, most of the programs and policies of the regional government to educate and prepare our people for freedom are based on five-year plans. And I think it would be unwise to say, at least, to interrupt the process of maturity of these programs with the upheaval that constitutional changes might occasion. To settle on a later date would mean a further period in national slavery, a prospect which I do not think any honorable member would welcome. We might, if we settle on a later date, have to draw up yet another interim constitution and waste time and public funds to arrange new elections. Still as a subject, I mean, still as a subject people, at the time when our sister colony on the Gold Coast and our kinsmen in the West Indies and places like Malaya will most assuredly be free independent nations. It seems to me, therefore, that we cannot afford to put date forward and it would be inadvisable to set it back. Convenience, therefore, dictates 1956. The argument on the grounds of previous commitment are even stronger. There may be some doubt as to whether any particular political party is fully representative of the people, but there can be no doubt whatsoever that any unanimous view above by the majority of political parties must represent the true feelings of the politically conscious citizens of any country. And in 1956, from this point of view, enjoys the advantage of unanimity. The action group, the NCNC, the Northern Elements Progressive Union, the 
Askianist, our movement, the Convention People's Party have all publicly declared self-government in 1956. And I am confident that today, on this historical, I mean, on this historic day in the political annals of this country, I am confident that the Northern People's uh, Congress will take the opportunity of this debate to associate themselves with the declared objective of all other true nationalists in this country. Sir, the action group, the NCNC, the Northern Element Progressive Union, and indeed all true nationalists who interviewed the Labour Party delegation left them in no doubt that 1956 is their irrevocable choice. I myself, in the course of my tour of the United Kingdom last year, gave many interested organizations and our own students over there to understand that we are deeply committed to 1956. I am sure that Chief Body Thomas, Chief Arthur Prest, Mr. Aripo, and Mr. Unwapa, who represented us abroad last year in their ministerial capacities, would, I mean, could not have failed to make this claim. Chief Body Thomas has even gone further to publicize our ambition in Canada and New York to world personalities. All these great people and I mean, all these great people and organizations are looking forward to the emergence in 1956 of the largest and greatest Negro nation in the world as a free independent country. We have all at one time or another held out high hopes for 1956 to our own people at mass meetings at public lectures, in the press and through other media, our people are expectants. We have, all of us, whether it is the Action Group or the NCNC or other parties, promised at one time or another to lead them to the promised land in 1956. We cannot go back on our plighted word. You will understand. Therefore, Mr. President, that on these three grounds of previous commitments, 1956 is a position from which it is impossible to retreat. And that is why this motion recommends it to this house for adoption. Mr. President, there are one or two minor points to answer on this subject, such as shall we in fact be able to rule ourselves in 1956? Shall we have enough knowledge and knowledgeable men and women? I dare any ground for the fear on the part of some members from the North that they will be dom dominated by the South? I shall leave those questions, sir, to be dealt with by my honorable friends who will speak after me for the moment. I hope I have said enough to show why it is of paramount importance that this House should set a target for self-government and why that date should be 1956. One final observation I would one final observation I would like to make is upon the attitude of the special members of this house and of the exco official members to this motion. I believe, sir, that the subject of self-government is an issue between Nigerians and the British government. It is nothing to do with my good and honorable friends, the special members, or with my equality good sorry, equally good and honorable friends are the ex-official members. I hold the view that no, not, I mean, non-Nigerian has the right uh, to express a, an opinion in this house on this subject or seek to influence the course of this debate on the time um, that we may choose to strike for freedom. We are the elected representatives of our people and that applies to all Nigerians here. We are all elected by some, pro I mean, by some process. We, as the elected representatives of our people, do not require the assistance of aliens to help us to decide when we should be free. I would therefore appeal to the special members to refrain from speaking and from voting on this motion, whatever their private feelings may be. The ex-official members, sir, are in a similar position. Their functions in this house relate to the work of certain specified departments of government. Perhaps they have the interest of Nigeria at heart. Perhaps they have not. Their private feelings are entirely their own, I mean, their own concern and are of no consequence in this debate. The subject of this motion is not covered by the portfolio of any of ex-official. 
member, I would like, therefore, to appeal to them in all sincerity to stay out of this debate, sir, and to let us Nigerians argue our own demands and desires and differences among ourselves. We will go into lobbies, sir, to decide the future of our own people and of our own children. None of the officials has, has a stake in this country. And I mean no offense at all when I describe them as mere bears of passage. They are here today, sir, but being out of the colonial service, they may well be elsewhere tomorrow by transfer or by retirement. I beseech them, therefore, not to take any course which might lead to an estrangement between us and them. Mr. President, the whole country, I might even say the whole world, is awaiting the verdict of this house on this motion. News of what we say here today will travel far and wide. I do not know how many honorable members read the English press. They may have noticed in the Daily Telegraph an account of the debate which took place here last week on uh, nudity. I am sure that any honorable member looking back now and reading an account of that debate will feel thoroughly ashamed of the decisions of this house. I appeal, sir, to all sections of this house not to let us repeat the mistake of underestimating the extent of overseas interest in the proceedings of this house. Our minds are irrevocably made up on the issue of self-government in 1956. I beg to move. With an Oro's motion, the action group had lobbied a political grid. I mean, the action group had lobbed a political grenade into the new House of Representatives, and all political parties had to take a position. That is where we are going to stop the reading today. And for the sake of uh, those who want to react to it, I am going to open the line. Listen. When you are reacting to histories like this, ideally, you should be telling us what you have learned. I have learned this now. Now I know this better. Now, in fact, I am not reading this to you so that you can come here and inherit or renew your hatred for one another. We all know that there is already existing prejudice, bias, hatred towards one another in that contraption. The purpose of reading this book is for you to have an idea how it all started and why. And if you listening to me right now, is going to show that uh, you have learned something. It should be what you have learned from that history, not the hatred that you have uh, possibly reignited a lot of you read the history because you just want to reignite or revalidate your hatred towards one another we know nigeria is not meant to be a country we we're all countries before this contraption the interest of those who brought this contraption together and those who have been driving the agenda of one nigeria one nigeria we know it and the reason why we must make sure that uh, if when we read our history, we learn from that history. Don't ever be a prisoner of history. Okay. I would never hold anything against any Igbo man now because of whatever Unamdi Azikiwe and Co did. I'm not going to hold anything against you as a northerner because of uh, what uh, uh, Fodio, uh, Fulani, and then uh, Fula Ausa and the rest of them did. No. And it's the same thing you shouldn't be holding all of this now. You learn from what happened then. Learning from it means what were those things missing? Respect and regard for one another. All the British that planted the entire division and those who didn't have the foresight to know that a generation like me and you are coming to this world. They never cared. They cared about themselves and their short-sightedness. At the end of the day, they have left us 
in a sheet hole. Now that sheet hole today, me, you, all of us are now endangered species in it. But there are still some of their agents telling you there's nothing we can do about it. They are mentioning unity. We call them unity beggars. Unity that Nigeria never had. We were never one. There was never one Nigeria. Even those who try to push and push and see if it will work, they've all come back and realized that it's a failed project. Nigeria is a failed project of British. But there are those who are benefiting from it right now, like those who benefited from it back then. So there are those who are benefiting from it now. And they will love the status quo to remain. They will make up stories to make it look like uh, we have no choice. They will maintain the divisive uh, rhetoric, the divisive uh, rhetoric that they are spread, spreading every now and then. The hatred that you are witnessing and all that. They will tell you Nigeria cannot break because if Nigeria break, the uh, tribal, ethnic, uh, religious causes that is upon Nigeria, every one of them will break. I mean, you know, the Igbos will have Biafra. Igbos, uh, even if the Igbos says they don't want to be part of the Igbos in, the, in Biafra and they want to have their own country, they can have their own country because they had their own country. All before this whole thing were fused together. Same thing with every part of, you know, have your own country where you speak your own language, where you trash and treat your own problems by yourselves. Yeah. So what you have next is going to be respect. Respect for that people. Respect for these people. Respect will be earned, and it will be earned genuinely when people's identity are genuinely restored. They will restore your identity. You will probably have to drag it out and get it yourself. So yes, I am going to keep the line opened. For those who probably want to uh, contribute to this or uh, maybe add something too, like we normally do. So I'll keep the line open, like I said, and then uh, you can call in if you want, okay? So yeah, we can all still live in peace, like people say, but we cannot live in peace if our identity are taken away from us and the wrong one is foisted on us. Nigeria identity is an identity of identity of uh, oppression, identity of uh, supremacy. But that wasn't the identity of, that's not the identity of the Yorubas. That's not the identity of the Aousas. That's not the identity of the majority of uh, the nationalities in Nigeria, except the Fulanese, who came in to come and enslave the Aousas, took over their land, took over their, their everything, and then foisted all these years, so foisted the idea, I, I, I tried to foist another identity on them. But before Nigeria, eh, there was no supremacy of Igbos bigger than Yoruba, Yoruba bigger than this or that. No, 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 no. everybody's just, they were running their own things. Yeah, brother. Hello there. Hello, good morning, Mayukun. This good. is Festus. Festus, Baba. How are you this morning? I'm doing well. I was actually going to ask you what your take was from the reading you did yesterday and then this morning, particularly um, about the Governor General Bodilian and his creation of East and West um, Nigeria. My view is that uh, for the first time, I now understand the evil that uh, British colonialism truly represents. It's beyond they are taking our products, they are, I mean, they are taking our resources. They, are, they actually came and planted this tribal division intentionally, so as to at least get us all together and keep their own interest longer than after independence. It makes me sort of burning for boiling from inside. But like I said, I'm reading all this to be a better person, not to inherit their enemy and all that. You get what I mean? Because it is now yeah. kind of understood you yeah um why is it that when you look at um the yorubas under the oyo empire right and then the Bini kingdom there might have been a few 
you know, was back in the day as well. Why is it that I would probably think maybe we lived peacefully amongst each other, but why is it that there isn't any tribal or ethnic animosities among those two ethnic group of people? Well, like part of what I read in that uh, book and some others as well, uh, Festus, uh, we heard that except for a period of unrest, especially in the Yoruba land, where people kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, invade other communities and in times of war and all that, I say except for that, right? Yorubas and the yeah. Bene Kingdom, the Oyo Kingdom and the Bene Kingdom, eh? they had a very, very cordial relationship. I mean, they, they, they both knew where they are, the stretch of their kingdoms. To the point that they were actually, apart from the historical one that, you know, Odudu was a grandson who was sent to Bene and all of that, all of that right? Apart from that, they said yeah. in the recent times, as recent as, uh, let's say, uh, 17th, 18th century, right? These two kingdoms yeah. existed and they were trading. They were even like exchanging, uh, what do you call this uh, 